In addition to being a common root cause for SIBO, low stomach acid can cause symptoms that might mimic SIBO, things like post-meal fullness, bloating, and indigestion. And low stomach acid might actually cause bacterial dysbiosis, overgrowth, and slow motility. It could even impair your ability to secrete things like bile and pancreatic enzymes. So when I say that low stomach acid is a big deal, I mean it's a really big deal. And I've talked about this topic in depth here on this channel. I've talked about how vagal tone can help you get better stomach acid production, how to test yourself at home using the betaine HCL challenge. But there is a common root cause of hypochlorhydria, low stomach acid, that I have yet to talk about in depth on this channel. So join me for this three-part series as we take a deep dive into the world of autoimmune atrophic gastritis, or AAG for short. Now, first of all, I just want to paint you a little bit of a clinical picture of like what this is and why it's a big deal. And then later in the video, we're going to talk about signs and symptoms, aka hints that will tip you off as to whether or not you might have this condition. And we're going to talk about some laboratory testing that can help point you in the right direction and ultimately get you the diagnosis or rule this out as a diagnosis. So without further ado, I have drawn my infamously horrendous, but still helpful, hopefully, uh, depiction of the human digestive system from mouth to anus. So we've got the mouth, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, and colon. And this is where your food and your critters are gonna traverse before they get into your poop. So as you can see, I've zoomed in on the stomach a bit. And as we should well know, at, right out the gate from this video, the stomach should have acid in it. And this is gonna help you digest all sorts of stuff, ranging from protein to B, vitamin, B vitamins to minerals like iron and calcium and magnesium. So that stomach acid is a really good thing, despite the messaging we might hear in the conventional medical setting of acid being bad. If we were to zoom in with a microscope and look at the cells that make up the stomach, especially these glands that produce acid, we would see that we have uh, mucus secreting cells going up the neck of this, this structure. And then we have these parietal cells, which I'm gonna highlight in this orange color. And this is the target of the autoimmune attack in AAG. So your immune system is erroneously attacking part of your body. That's the whole definition of autoimmunity. In this case, the target tissue that is being attacked incorrectly is the parietal cells. And parietal cells are the cells in your gut that make stomach acid. So as you knock those out one by one, there goes your ability to make stomach acid. And again, this is a big deal because it could either cause SIBO or it can cause symptoms that mimic SIBO, or it can cause other problems even in the absence of SIBO. So let me briefly refresh your memory on that. Like I said, stomach acid is needed to digest a lot of your food, including protein, vitamin B12, and minerals like calcium, magnesium, and iron. Also though, remember, the pH of the contents coming out of the stomach and into that first part of the small bowel is going to dictate or stimulate the response from the gallbladder and the pancreas. And without that stimulation coming from the acid coming into that location, without that acidic trigger, these two organs might just miss the memo and not squirt out as many of their juices as we would like to see. So this could even be relevant for people with a history of gallstones or gall sludge or pancreatic exocrine insufficiency or epi for short. So these two things are gonna be affected. Now, changing the pH and changing the chemical makeup and the juices made up in the small intestine can hopefully obviously cause bacterial dysbiosis or overgrowth, which we would call SIBO. And again, SIBO can cause a lot of these same symptoms. I don't think it's coincidence that they overlap so much, but delayed motility, bloating, increased abdominal pressure, abdominal pain, post-meal fullness, like you eat three bites and you feel super full. That feeling like you have a brick of lead in your stomach and it just sits there and it's not moving. All of these could be attributable to low stomach acid, SIBO, or both. So changing this chemical makeup and changing these signaling molecules in this location can be pretty disastrous, as assuming that you want healthy digestion at least. 
And here's the kicker too. This condition is not uncommon as we're gonna get into in a moment, but also it is classically undiagnosed or misdiagnosed for many, many years. And that's because the common misconception that you see even in some research still is that this condition in and of itself, the attack on the parietal cells itself does not cause any specific symptoms. And therefore we don't know who to send in for blood work or an endoscopy to try to diagnose this thing. So instead patients present with vague dyspeptic symptoms, bloating, early satiety, and epigastric discomfort or pain, and they get batted around from doctor to doctor, specialist to specialist, getting diagnosed with SIBO and God only knows what else, when the real root cause goes unattended. Now let's get into the symptoms of this condition so that you can have a better understanding of if this is relevant for you, right? Like what is the likelihood that you actually have this condition and you need to pursue a diagnostic workup? Is it something that you should absolutely go ask your doctors for, or is it something that you can kind of pass on because it doesn't sound relevant to you? For some of you, this is gonna be a major light bulb moment and you're gonna think, whoa, I have all of these signs and symptoms and the history and it just, it makes sense. This is the missing puzzle piece that I've been looking for. And some of you will be like, no, on to the next video. Now, it is worth mentioning again, because I think this is really important. This might not be on the radar of your medical team. You might actually be the one to bring it to their attention because it is a notoriously underdiagnosed condition. And that is because a lot of people with this condition don't present with upper GI symptoms, so they never get scoped. But also because the symptoms that people do present with are oftentimes very vague. You can have a million different root causes for something like bloating or indigestion, so we don't get that nice like, ah, it's this moment with our medical team. It's instead this conversation of, oh, it could be one of these bazillions of different things and maybe we could work you up for a handful of them. And it's this really painful, long drawn out process of trying to figure out what's going on with you. But there are symptoms that are seemingly directly attributable to the low acid. Now again, remember a lot of medical professionals and some researchers still believe that the loss of parietal cell function, the loss of HCL doesn't have any symptoms in and of itself. A lot of people still believe that you don't get symptoms of this condition until you are blatantly, overtly B12 deficient. And then you're just looking for signs and symptoms of B12 deficiency. But that does not appear to be the case because they have done studies in this population and they have mapped out some of the more common symptoms. So for example, coming over here, I will point out first that about out of the people who are symptomatic, which is about half of people with this condition, of those people, about 70-ish percent of them have upper GI symptoms. So this would be something like GERD or indigestion or what feels like gastritis or acid reflux. But about 15% have only lower GI symptoms, which I find fascinating. And it really paints a picture of the importance of stomach acid and things like iron and B12 in our lower digestive function, right? I know we didn't talk much about the latter part of the tube here when I drew this out, but you could absolutely have something like constipation from low stomach acid. I've seen it many times. And then about 15% of people have both upper and lower digestive complaints. So this might be somebody who has dyspepsia, AKA indigestion and also constipation. It might be somebody who has bloating and delayed stomach emptying and diarrhea. So there's a little bit of a mishmash, but it does seem to be leaning more strongly towards upper GI involvement as opposed to lower exclusively. Now, as I mentioned before, the, the, Symptoms initially are vague dyspeptic symptoms, AKA indigestion. So that's the feeling of post meal fullness, heaviness, early satiety, like early fullness. Oh, I ate four bites and I feel like I ate at a buffet. Epigastric discomfort, discomfort in this upper part of the stomach and lower part of the chest, uh, bloating, maybe a little bit of an acidy feeling, but not necessarily coming up into the throat. And about 57% of the symptomatic patients in this condition have dyspepsia or dyspeptic symptoms. Interestingly, 80% of people with this condition, whether or not they have symptoms, 
have delayed stomach emptying. So makes you really curious if you've ever received a diagnosis or a hypothesized diagnosis of something like gastroparesis. Maybe this is the reason why people have delayed gastric emptying. About 47% of people with this condition have bloating. Again, looking very SIBO-y, if, if you ask me at least. And about 25% of people report GERD or some sort of acid reflux type symptomology. Importantly, and we're going to get into this more in depth in the next video, about half of people coming in with AAG have either iron deficiency or iron deficiency anemia. So this is a really common complaint, and it might even be the initial presenting symptom for the majority of these people. Mystery iron deficiency. Mystery iron deficiency that doesn't seem to respond to supplementation can be a really big clue to this. And similarly, in the latter stages of this condition, not necessarily in early stages, a lot of people will become B12 deficient. A, because you need stomach acid to digest your B12, but also these parietal cells make something called intrinsic factor, and you need intrinsic factor to absorb your B12 later on down the tube in the small intestine. So anywhere from about 40-ish to 60-ish percent of people with this condition are overtly B12 deficient. Now again, like some of you are gonna kind of look at this list and think, nope, this doesn't sound like me. And some of you are having a freak out moment right now thinking, whoa, I have all of these things. What do I do and how do I get tested for this? And the good news for that is that I'm gonna cover the testing in depth in the next video. There are three flavors of testing that you could pursue, including antibody testing, nutrient-based testing like iron and B12, and tests that look at gastric corpus atrophy or like the actual functioning of the stomach. And we could judge that at least a little bit based on blood work. So we're gonna talk about that soon enough. Last but not least, there's another major clinical clue that can tip you off as to the likelihood of this condition. And that is the existence of one other already diagnosed autoimmune disease. So this is gonna be relevant for you if you have been diagnosed with something like Hashimoto's or Graves' disease or type one diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, vitiligo, you name it, there's a lot of other autoimmune diseases I could rattle off, but those are the ones that are particularly associated with this condition. And importantly, people with at least one prior diagnosed autoimmune disease or a known autoimmune disease are five times more likely to have this particular type of autoimmunity. And people with autoimmune thyroid disease, meaning Hashimoto's and Graves, are especially at an increased risk. About one third of patients with autoimmune thyroid disease have the antibodies for this condition. And about one third of people with this condition have antibodies against their thyroid. So either way you look at it, from either angle, you have about a 30 some odd percent risk of having this condition or having autoimmune thyroid disease if you get this diagnosis. And it's to a point where in the research studies they say, when somebody receives this diagnosis officially, doctors should be automatically screening them for autoimmune thyroid disease because it is that common. The link is so strong. And I think that is perfectly reasonable and prudent given a, that about one third of these patients are gonna have antibodies against their thyroid. Now we're gonna talk more about the diagnostic workup and the antibodies and all of that in the next video. And then we're gonna round out this three part series with more of the treatment and what you should do if you do receive this diagnosis. But I hope that this at least painted this clinical picture of what this condition is, why it's a big deal, why the stomach acid matters, and what type of clinical picture could hint that this is going on and ultimately is there a reason for you as an individual to pursue this diagnosis and pursue this workup with your medical team? So I hope that I've helped you have some aha moments, make some good decisions about your health, and I will see you in the next video. But first, a shameless plug. I would be remiss if I did not tell you a little bit about FODMAP Freedom right now, because symptoms like indigestion, bloating, and pooping problems are my jam, and I am so good at helping people get rid of those symptoms. Whether those symptoms are coming from autoimmune atrophic gastritis or low stomach acid of a different cause, 
or other digestive issues or SIBO, candida, or leaky gut, I've got you covered. And more importantly, not just the education you'll receive in FODMAP Freedom, but the coaching makes all the difference in the world. So when you're feeling frazzled and overwhelmed and feeling like you need to go click on every Instagram ad imaginable and buy every single supplement you see, the coaches, me and my nutritionist inside FODMAP Freedom can help you reevaluate, take a chill pill and go about things in the most methodical, effective and least overwhelming way possible. And if you want to learn more, we're going to be enrolling again in January, which is not that far away. The end of the year is going to whiz right by our heads before we even know what happened. So if you go to the description box down below, there's a link for the FODMAP Freedom waitlist. Go ahead and click on that. And if you submit your email, all that means is that you're going to get alerted when I have a new YouTube video every week. I send out an email with that. But also you're going to effectively skip the line and get first dibs on your seat when we open in January, which is really important because we actually have had to close enrollment early before because we reached capacity. And you're going to get a special bonus gift when you enroll during that first open enrollment week for people on the wait list. If you want to wait and just wait until I post about it openly on Instagram and YouTube, you could do that too, but you won't get the fast action bonus. So if you are even thinking about joining FODMAP Freedom right now, I would encourage you to submit your email on that waitlist form and just make sure that you're in line and you're going to get those emails when they go out in January. And like I said, whether you have the autoimmune atrophic gastritis, you have these symptoms from that or low stomach acid or poor bile flow, leaky gut, candida, SIBO, you name it. I really think that I have your bases covered in FODMAP Freedom to the point where I'm going to put a 100% money back guarantee on my work. If you join FODMAP Freedom and you do not feel better in one year, I will give you every penny of your investment back. And I don't know of anybody else here on YouTube making that kind of a bold guarantee.